afternoon. Uh, welcome to the State Department, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, uh, Ambassador Smith, Ambassador Noyes, Mrs. Valls, uh, Ambassador Gutierrez. Um, my name is uh, Philip Rieker. I'm the uh, Acting Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of uh, European and Eurasian Affairs. Um, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all to this uh, Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy initiative, I believe the second event in uh, a really terrific uh, series. Uh, and I do want to thank Ambassador Dan Smith and Ambassador Noyes uh, from our Foreign Service Institute uh, for having the honor of introducing today's program and also our, our panelists, thank you, uh, who are going to provide some very interesting insights on the role of U.S. diplomats in World War I. I am an amateur historian, uh, like a few colleagues in the Foreign Service, a history major in college, uh, and particularly uh, these days of anniversaries and commemorations. Uh, I think it's so important for our contemporary diplomacy to uh, look back uh, at where we've come, certainly over the last century, or in the case of uh, World War I, uh, a little more than a century, having or getting ready to uh, commemorate the 101st anniversary of that. In, in that context, um, special thanks goes to the Una Chapman Cox Foundation for its really generous support of the Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy Initiative. And we do have Ambassador Lino Gutierrez from the Cox Foundation joining us today. Lino, it's great to have you back in the State Department. Really good to see you. And I'm pleased to welcome the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission from the Embassy of Belgium here in Washington, Mr. Christophe Payot. Thank you uh, for joining us. Belgium obviously has a, a crucial historical role in terms of uh, World War I and uh, is a close partner and, and uh, an ally. In September of uh, this year, the department kicked off this, Heres this Heroes of U.S. Diplomacy initiative with the strong support of Secretary Pompeo. And it recognizes heroes from our past and from our present who advanced U.S. policy goals and the mission of the Department of State while all displaying sound judgment, intellectual vigor, and moral or physical courage and overcoming great challenges. And when we think of great diplomatic challenges, one that springs to mind uh, of anyone with an historic perspective is World War I, the Great War, the war to end all wars. Uh, some of us perhaps know a little more uh, recently about being literally in the trenches, um, but that uh, certainly comes to mind when we think about World War I. And when the guns of August first loaded and fired in uh, 1914, the United States of America was not considered by many as one of the world's great powers. But by the time the war had ended in 1918, America had assumed a major role on the global stage, not only militarily, but in promoting peace. Despite America's official neutrality in the early years of the war, President Woodrow Wilson approved a major buildup of U.S. military. Since, as one editor of the time uh, wrote, quote, the best things about a large army and a strong navy is that they make it so much easier to say just what we want to say in our diplomatic correspondence. And our diplomatic correspondence took on a much more important role during the war. The Department of State fulfilled its obligation to safeguard American citizens in war-torn countries, and State Department officials helped the American Red Cross, utilizing figures like a young Ernest Hemingway, before he had written a farewell to arms, to get medicine as well as fully equipped and staffed hospitals into belligerent states in order to help the wounded. Numerous private relief organizations utilized State Department channels to transfer money to those rendered impoverished by the fighting. The warring European powers also turned to Washington for help protecting their interests worldwide, which required department officers to take on enormous new tasks, such as protecting property, securing sensitive documents, and looking after prisoners of war. And just like us, they served as control officers. During the Paris Peace Conference to end the war, President Woodrow Wilson spent six months in France. Talk about the ultimate POTUS visit. 
And I understand that the president then went on to travel uh, throughout Europe. And I, as a side note, I, I recently paid uh, a visit to the Republic of San Marino, one of our smaller uh, friends and countries in, uh, in Europe. And they told me then that I was the first official from Washington, uh, not just our um, ambassador or our consul general from Florence, but the first official from Washington to visit since President Woodrow Wilson. So um, I've checked my box uh, on history. Now our panel of historians today will highlight some of these extraordinary stories. And you can read much more at www.history.state.gov especially under the heading World War I and the Department. America's experience during the Great War fundamentally altered our nation's diplomatic machinery. Changes in technology, in industry, and the balance of power rendered the United States less insulated from world trends. In fact, as a result of World War I, an imperative to create a unified professional foreign service coalesced, and in May 1924, the Rogers Act was signed into law. The act remains the foundation of the modern Department of State. It gave the US Foreign Service a salary structure that opened up its ranks beyond those who were personally wealthy. It appointed all department diplomatic and consular officials to general employment classes rather than a specific overseas position, which Believe it or not, at that time required new congressional authorization every time any officer moved to a new posting. Imagine trying to get your travel orders for that. Uh, it created the Board of Examiners and allowed Foreign Service officers to get promoted to ambassadorial and other senior level positions. It provided the first allowances for representation expenses, family transportation, even if by ship, and I think under the FAM you can still take your horse uh, to post. Also residency costs and funds to procure office spaces and diplomatic residences overseas, many of which of course were acquired uh, in, in that post-World War I period and continue to be some of our, our masterpieces in terms of uh, residences for our ambassadors and deputy chiefs of mission. It offered the first retirement and disability benefits and it established the training and education program known today as the Foreign Service Institute. So these are origins I think many of us actually in the Foreign Service, some for far too long, in, in my case, uh, didn't even realize uh, have their origins back to the changes uh, that happened because of, of World War I. It, indeed, it led to a great many changes in the world, in America, and in our profession. So, I'm delighted uh, you'll have the opportunity to learn about those heroes of US diplomacy uh, more today. I apologize and I'm actually very disappointed that I can't stay uh, around to hear this, but I will be turning to the website. Um, I've got a long airplane flight tonight. It gives me a good excuse to buy the Wi-Fi on United. Um, but I'm really pleased uh, to introduce um, the moderator of this panel discussion, a, a good friend, colleague, mentor, uh, the director of today's Foreign Service Institute, Ambassador Daniel Smith. As many know, Ambassador Smith was the U.S. Ambassador to Greece from 2010 to 2013, when he and I had a, a very regular um, uh, connectivity since I worked in a country to the north of, uh, of Greece. And prior to taking on his current role at FSI, Dan was the Assistant Secretary of State for Intelligence and Research. I think we're all in for a very intelligent and well-researched <laughs> panel discussion today. I welcome you again to the State Department and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Ambassador Reeker for that wonderful introduction. Uh, he's stolen all of my thunder now. <laughs> Um, it really is a fitting, though, that I think we have the person who is responsible for conducting and guiding our European affairs uh, at the State Department today introduce today's topic, which will focus largely on the role that our diplomatic predecessors played over 100 years ago in Europe uh, in dealing with the um, impact of the Great War uh, 
not only on American citizens, but also on Europeans who are there. And it, it's wonderful that the uh, embassy in Belgium is here. I appreciate that very much. I think many of us, when we think about those relief efforts, think about Belgium because of the relief effort that was guided by uh, then uh, private citizen Herbert Hoover. Um, but it was only part of the story, really, and we're going to get into more depth about everything that our predecessors did in response to that uh, great conflict and the enormous challenges they felt. Um, as Ambassador Reeker indicated, this Heroes of Diplomacy initiative started with a recognition of, of one of our contemporary heroes who's in the audience today, Lizzie Slater, who's going to be angry at me for recognizing her yet again, but um, who is a great uh, example of contemporary heroes, of people who really go above and beyond in advancing our nation's interests abroad uh, and carrying out the work of this great department. But really, we have a unique opportunity with the Heroes of Diplomacy also to shed light on aspects of our history that are not as well known. Uh, and really, today's panel, I think, will, uh, will uh, I hope, uh, excite some enormous interest on the part of our um, colleagues in some of that untold stories from our past uh, of people who really did go above and beyond in extraordinary circumstances to help their fellow citizens um, and to carry out the foreign policy of the United States. We've tapped today the enormous uh, experience and, and talent and insight of the Office of the Historian here at the State Department, now part of the Foreign Service Institute, I'm proud to say. Um, and three of our panelists are currently with the Office of the Historian, and one is, is a, a recent alumni of the, uh, of the office, uh, and they will shed light on some of the uh, unique aspects of the conflict and what happened. We've given the title of today's uh, presentation in the diplomatic trenches, Department Heroes Alleviate Suffering During World War I, 1914 to 1917. I think it's important in setting the stage for today's discussion to remember the challenge that we faced in 1914 as a country. We had never before had, as we did have in 1914, tens of thousands of Americans trapped in a war zone. We'd never before had to evacuate them from that conditions and those conditions. Uh, we'd never faced a situation in which we had to provide as a neutral power the sort of scale of assistance and support on both sides uh, of the fighting, not only to combatants and those who'd been uh, taken prisoner of war, but also to civilians who were trapped uh, and, and suffering as a result of the war. We took those neutral obligations seriously. We carried them out, I think, with great distinction. And it, it can honestly be said we saved, if not tens of thousands, perhaps millions of lives in that effort. This was due to the men and women who carried out our foreign policy, both either as employees or as family members, as we will see in this discussion today. Uh, but more importantly, not more importantly, but, but important from our perspective, uh, these, the lessons learned from this era had an important uh, bearing on the future of the Department of State and the structure of the Department of State we have today. And we'll get into that in the course of this discussion. Our first panelist, Dr. Seth Rotermel, will focus on U.S. government efforts to help American citizens trapped in Europe escape the conflict, as well as our diplomatic activities that were undertaken in Germany, including how department f officials facilitated the delicate process of deploying volunteer American National Red Cross medical hospital units in belligerent countries. Thank you, Ambassador Smith. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Thank you um, for everyone for giving up their lunch break. Uh, to be here. This is, uh, for me, this is absolutely fascinating uh, to combine uh, a few loves of mine, which is uh, the history of Germany, also the history of U.S. foreign uh, relations, and also so diplomatic history. Um, before you, if this is uh, the individual that I have studied for a while, Ambassador so James Girard. This is actually his campaign poster. Um, I'll flash back in a second, but uh, he was running for U.S. Senate while he was ambassador uh, in Berlin uh, in the first two months of the outbreak of the First World War, while everything was chaos in the, um, in the embassy in Berlin. So he had the, uh, the gumption and the political uh, courage, perhaps, to uh, seek higher office while also as maintaining, um, <clears throat> trying to maintain uh, control over a crisis. So James Girard, uh, he came from New York. He was um, a state Supreme Court judge. He was very involved in so democratic 
party politics up there. Uh, um, finally, in 1913, um, a Democrat actually won the White House after a long, long spell. Um, he was his um, he was a big um, part of that of that success. He was a he was a major donor to the Wilson campaign. Uh, it had been his dream for a while to go live in Europe, um, enjoy some time, um, and sort of um, instead of just traveling through the courts of Europe, actually become part of uh, of of the diplomatic scene. His father-in-law, um, his wife's. Um, his father was one of the richest uh, people in the country at the time. It was Marcus Daly, the, uh, the founder of the state of Montana, the Copper King. So he had some political backing, uh, some monetary backing. Also, his father-in-law was the main supporter of William Jen uh, so Jennings Bryan's um, uh, two presidential campaigns. So his new boss, the Secretary of State, um, well, he had a, um, a unique relationship with his new boss. They, uh, their families went back uh, quite a ways. You can um, discern this in some of the correspondence. It's not uh, it's necessarily someone talking to their boss with uh, full deference. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so he finds out that uh, he's on this trip to, uh, he is on a trip to Europe, um, uh, sailing on the luxury liner, uh, the German Imperator, uh, to go take uh, the vacation in Europe. <clears throat> when he finds out uh, through cable that he has been nominated uh, to be the ambassador to the German Empire. Um, he was overjoyed. Um, he learns a few, uh, few lines of German uh, to, uh, um, so that uh, in a few months he can offer up his um, credentials uh, to the Kaiser himself. So he takes his family over to Germany. Uh, this is at a time where uh, peace uh, was reigning, even though there was a large arms buildup and a, um, and a what we see now as an inevitable as a race towards war, but at the time it seemed pretty sunny. He showed up and he found out that the embassy, that the, uh, that the Department of State did not own any property in Berlin, and the, uh, his, um, uh, um, his, his predecessor, where he had the, um, the ambassador, was pretty small uh, lodgings, not something that he was used to, so what he did was, at his own personal expense, rent a palace uh, right across the street uh, from uh, the foreign ministry, um, and um, <clears throat> right where, uh, in, the, uh, in the very seat of government. This was a huge operation, costing perhaps in today's funds something like three or four million dollars a year. So um, he had that uh, so, so renovated. Uh, he spent the, uh, the rest of 1913, early 1914, going to a lot of these diplomatic balls. Berlin was the diplomatic uh, capital of the world at the time because of all those German principalities and kingdoms all sent their own ambassadors to Berlin uh, to go um, talk with the Kaiser. So he got to see that um, firsthand. Um, he went to Kiel Week, which is up there in the north on the Baltic um, um, Sea, and this was a this was a tradition for the Kaiser to go up there and race his special yacht. So the day before, he was actually having dinner uh, on the Kaiser's private yacht. Uh, the day before, Franz Ferdinand uh, was assassinated in Sarajevo. So uh, the rest of Kiel Week, uh, some of the events were canceled. Uh, the rest weren't. This was seen as something um, <clears throat> um, relatively in, um, in consequential at the time. There had been a lot of problems in the Balkans. Uh, quote, another mess in the Balkans. Uh, no one had the idea that this would actually turn into something. So he got back to Berlin after a nice little so sojourn, and everything collapsed. Uh, first, the banking, uh, the international banking system collapsed. Stock markets collapsed. Uh, um, also, international so communications in continental Europe also collapsed. So he was suddenly faced with um, a a crisis, and what um, uh, what the main crisis for him was is how to get Americans who uh, were caught in the summer, so traveling on Central Europe, um, how to get them home. Since the way that people, often very very uh, wealthy people, traveled uh, uh, was to have lines of credit uh, in uh, the form of a piece of paper that says, "My bank knows that I'm rich. I can pay for this." And at that point, all the, um, all the German banks said, I don't care anymore because I can't get that money. So suddenly, you had a lot of people who uh, were very not used to being destitute. They were destitute. And they came to the US embassy. They also came to all the consulates, uh, US consulates um, um, all over so Central Europe, and uh, demanding a way home. What the United States government did in very short order, within two or three days of the declaration of war in Europe, 
was to send the USS Tennessee, it was called the gold ship, that sent um, at that time 200, almost $300 million in gold, in gold bullion. Half of that was uh, money from some private banks. They were trying to, uh, to corner the shortage of gold and some species in London, and the rest was from the Department of State. Uh, there were several, so Treasury um, Department officers uh, there as well, and the plan there was to try to disperse this gold as loans to private U.S. citizens who could not find their way back. Um, in very short order, he turned the embassy into a factory of making uh, temporary passports. Again, this was a time uh, before a passport was required. He found um, uh, all ad hoc. It was absolutely amazing. It didn't um, seem, uh, from my perspective, uh, when I studied his pre-war years, that uh, uh, he just turned, he turned into a hero of diplomacy. Uh, he estimated at the time there's probably about 10,000 American citizens that are trapped in Europe. Turns out there was about 80,000 at least in Central Europe itself. Uh, he was able to organize trains. Um, he was, uh, to, I think, the, uh, to mostly uh, to Rotterdam, and then they would take a ship to, um, to England for the transatlantic voyage home. Um, <clears throat> this lasted for about two months. He was able to do that in uh, fairly short order. And he was also able to help the American Red Cross send out uh, American so hospitals uh, to, uh, to land it in the German Empire at the time. And, to, um, and actually, there was a third uh, that was in Munich. Um, and he organized uh, those doctors uh, who would be about 10 miles behind the German front lines and take care of the German wounded. Um, he stayed until uh, the breakdown of so diplomatic relations, which was in February of 1917. Um, it was a crazy story about how he was able to leave at the time. Uh, the German government um, imprisoned him uh, at home, uh, trying to force him to sign a document uh, that would allow for all German ships that were in US ports to have a safe so passage home. He refused to sign uh, as a stalemate for about a week. The, uh, the Department of State had no idea where he was. They got very, very worried. They started to, um, well, set out a lot of cables. Anyway. <laughs> He finally got home. I mean, just the desperation was, uh, was remarkable. James Gerard was uh, quite a fascinating character. He knew he would actually finally get home. Uh, he hired a private train car. Uh, not, I'm, a, I'm sorry, a private train. There's about six or seven cars. He took as many, as, um, as many Americans uh, back with him as he could. And he had commissioned uh, a bag full of gold cigarette cases. So if he needed to go, uh, um, if he needed to, if he needed to, convince someone at a border crossing that they should let him pass. He had something to offer them uh, uh, in terms of his appreciation. <laughs> He's a very smart guy. Uh, he was able to get out uh, through, uh, through France and sail home. And after that, he, um, he tried very desperately to become uh, the, next, uh, the next president of the United States. But uh, unfortunately, his experience as an ambassador uh, ruined his chances. I, I speak about that in a little bit. I'll stop there. So uh, that's ambassador. terrific. I'm, at, I'm gonna go along to all of our panelists before I come back to ask some specific questions of each of them. But I did want to say one thing that Seth had left out in this that he mentioned to me before was one of the edicts of the German government after war broke out was that every conversation had to be in German. So all of our embassy employees and others had to speak in German. I've decided as head of FSI, this is a great way to create language incentives. <laughs> And we should talk about this in the future. But <laughs> this happened both in, in Germany and France, by the way. All of our uh, telephone conversations, all of the conversations had to be in German or sure. French with the outbreak of the war. It's something we, we don't think about much. Our next panelist, Dr. Lindsay Krasnoff, as I said, is a former uh, historian with the Office of the Historian, is currently working as a consultant and global sports specialist. She'll give you uh, odds on the Nats later. Uh, <laughs> She will share the history of the extraordinary actions of an African-American consul in France who represented America with great distinction during the war, as well as some of the enormous challenges that our historic colleagues face, including having three ambassadors in country at the same time, something our colleagues in Belgium have to face all the time. <laughs> Dr. Krasnov will also recount the extraordinary humanitarian activities of the wives of department personnel, which included organizing hospitals, child welfare initiatives, and civilian relief efforts. Dr. Krasnoff. Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. Thank you to everyone who helped to make today possible. Um, and also a thank you to my former colleagues in the Office of the Historian, as well as at U.S. Embassy France, uh, without um, whom this project, or at least the France component, would never have really gotten off the ground. It's always a pleasure to come back and speak at the department and help to explore insights on how history still plays out today and also informs our world today. And it was also a real delight to revisit some of the material um, that I worked on for several years, uh, building into various different centennial um, anniversary efforts. Today's stories are close to my heart. Um, once upon a time, they captivated my imagination and tweaked my curiosity, uh, but also reinforced the fact that our counterparts 100 years ago were in so many ways just like us. And I think that's one of the really powerful parts of the entire story of um, US diplomats operating kind of on the fly uh, during the war years, particularly the neutral years. Um, they drove cars. They went to the cinema. They worked tirelessly. They fell ill from their um, overwork um, in the crux of the first weeks of the war. They found humor in even the darkest of hours. Um, they also wrote home asking who won the big uh, rivalry football game that they missed. Um, so I think they come across as very relatable in a way that we're usually not used to characters from 100 years ago uh, appearing to us today. Rereading views from the embassy, which is the, the, the um, French component of it, uh, you know, I fell in love again with the story, with the characters, and how the US diplomatic community in France, particularly in 1914, when it was literally all hands on deck, um, navigated uncharted territory, innovating, creating solutions, uh, demonstrating the need for flexibility and resilience at each and every turn, usually multiple times within an hour. Um, this was made all the more so because it was an unusual time at post. The summer of 1914, then US Ambassador to France, Myron T. Herrick, uh, was preparing to present his letter of recall. When war broke out, he was literally about to deliver his letter of recall. Um, instead, he held off. His uh, successor was still back in the United States. Uh, his wife, uh, William G. Sharp, his wife was too ill to travel. Uh, but necessity <laughs> uh, forced creativity on all sides. Um, and for the first several months of World War I, uh, we had not one, not two, but soon three US ambassadors to France, in France, even though only one was accredited. Um, and they navigated a lot of interesting territory and also helped to make the work of the diplomatic community in and around uh, post-Paris as effective as possible. It was a small staff in the summer of 1914, an ambassador, three secretaries, a few clerks, the military attache and his assistant, and that was pretty much it. Uh, but that quickly swelled in numbers as family members, wives, daughters, sons, cousins uh, were pressed into service. U.S. Uh, citizens volunteered, and we have really great quotes from some of those uh, volunteers, not knowing whether they were all of a sudden an attache or the doorman. Um, and together, they helped to navigate tricky waters without much of any instruction from Washington because the cross-Atlantic cables were initially uh, interrupted. Um, there was severe limitations on transportation in and around Paris as well as other parts of France uh, by government decree. So they had to become creative in figuring out how they got around town and were able to carry out their, um, their duties. They also had their duties multiply exponentially. If at the end of July 1914, US diplomats in France were responsible for caretaking for citizens of one country, the United States, within two months, they were responsible, in Paris at least, for caretaking for citizens and interests of eight countries, the United States, France, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Serbia, Japan, Britain, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, I think, if I've got them all down, mostly because the government of France relocated to Bordeaux in uh, early September 1914. Um, and the very close relationships between Ambassador Herrick and uh, the French uh, Premier uh, Poincaré 
uh, helped to build a lot of trust between the two and uh, subsequently why the U.S. circle was able to uh, fill in to the, the void in the way that they did. The experiences of the U.S. Dipl diplomatic community and their members uh, in France, especially during 1914, demonstrated the need for a robust, professionalized foreign service. And by the time we emerge from uh, the cycle of war in the first part of the 20th century, by the post-1945 period, the Foreign Service, as it's constituted, looks very similar to the functions um, and roles that were pioneered in 1914 in France. Uh, their stories also illustrate how the close personal ties, again, can help to foment that close working relationship. And it wasn't just Ambassador Herrick and um, Poincaré. It was uh, the close relationship between the French ambassador to the United States, J.J. Jusserand, um, and Ambassador Herrick. Um, and also be the close relationships between Consul Hunt in Saint-Étienne and uh, one of the French generals, Galilini, um, which raises some really interesting questions, especially when you get to the idea of three ambassadors on the ground and just why the government of France petitioned Woodrow Wilson to keep Ambassador Herrick on until the end of hostilities. Uh, so when thinking about how to best uh, unpack a little bit of the stories uh, from the uh, France circle, I thought about nominating three figures as kind of my, my heroes of diplomacy or heroines of diplomacy, as it were. Uh, the first is Carolyn Herrick, the 50-year-old wife of U.S. Ambassador Herrick, who alongside her husband helped to bring some ordered chaos to the craziness that quickly descended on post with the war's outbreak. She helped him to devise lodging and food arrangements for the thousands of American citizens stranded, penniless, in France during those first weeks. It wasn't just American citizens who had been vacationing in France or Switzerland, but also those from parts of Central Europe, from Italy, and elsewhere. Uh, and French banks uh, had refused for several weeks to uh, convert currency. They were concerned about being able to pay for goods. And we have examples of Ambassador Herrick uh, helping to organize local American businessmen in um, France to figure out this financial solution so that they could feed, clothe, and house people in the meantime. Uh, his wife, Kitty, was instrumental in all of those conversations. She was a guiding light to that power couple. Um, and she also stood out on her own. Uh, she quickly became known as the American angel among Parisians for her role uh, founding and really steering the American Ambulance Hospital's Women's Committee. Um, the American Ambulance Hospital was a, a private hospital, a U.S. based in a U.S. Um, influenced institution, but quickly accepted by the government of France as a military hospital, even though it acted independently. And both of the Herricks acknowledged early on that the work of this American ambulance hospital did m far more to promote uh, closeness of French-American relations um, than perhaps any other act in those first uh, weeks of war. Uh, so Kitty was very instrumental in that fundraising, helping to smooth over ruffled feathers, easing some of the tensions that would crop up amongst many strong personalities involved. She worked tirelessly side by side with her husband. Uh, they both fell ill, uh, Kitty so much so that she never fully recovered. Uh, Ambassador Herrick attributes her 1918 death to having its origins in her illness in the fall of 1914. Um, and so we see kind of a, a trace of a line there. My second nominee uh, for, for Heroes of Diplomacy is Mildred Barnes Bliss. She was, I call her thoroughly modern Millie, um, the 34, then 34 year old wife of the embassy's first secretary, Robert Woods Bliss, who was also instrumental in advocating for a more professionalized foreign service. Um, Mildred was also the heiress of a patent medicine fortune, so she had her own fortune and a very large one, which came in handy during her wartime work. She was also stepsister to her husband, which is a really interesting fact. Their parents did not get married until they were mostly already adults, but um, a fun fact for you. Go read the story. Um, <laughs> 
but, but Mildred used her vast personal fortune to fund her wartime work. Um, and yes, she did do many of the traditional socialite activities, such as fundraise, donate her own money, um, uh, volunteer in, uh, to nurse in some of the uh, hospitals. But she also went far and beyond that. She was very proactive. And not only did she establish several charities and funds, particularly for war orphans and widows, she also was very physically active. She would ride out um, to the battlefronts to assess the situation, to see what kinds of medical supplies, training, and aids and volunteers were needed. She would visit sanatoriums. She would visit refugee centers, um, again, trying to assess what was needed and how to best allocate resources, personnel, and donations. And this was very atypical for women of her uh, class um, at that time. Uh, but she's certainly one of the more remarkable characters I've come across. And her, her very, very lengthy war service was highly decorated by the French government at the end of the war. Uh, my third nominee is the rugby-loving consul at Saint-Étienne, William H. Hunt. Um, who was the only black uh, American diplomatic figure serving in Europe when war broke out in 1914. Um, the nature, I think, of living and operating in a smaller um, city than Paris meant that Hunt was much more deeply embedded in the local community than his counterparts in Paris were. Uh, part of that was also that he used what we now think of as sports diplomacy to outreach to and integrate with the local community in Saint-Étienne. Uh, Hunt arrived around 1907-1908 in Saint-Étienne um, and quickly found his way to the rugby local rugby club. Uh, he also quickly became its president and through sport he became a local pillar of the community outside of his consular duties. Um, and this is interesting because he was metissage, mixed race, and not as warmly welcomed in other communities where he had previously served. Um, he did not, I found no indication that he encountered difficulties uh, because of his background and heritage uh, when in France. But once the war broke out, his ties to that community, uh, his deep ties really came through. Of course, he carried through his consular functions and caretaking for American businesses and citizens in his consular district. But also, he quickly took on similar responsibilities for the French people in his district, especially those who were part of the rugby club. Many of his players had marched off to war in the summer of 1914, and Hunt was instrumental in helping to track down their whereabouts as the war war on, um, particularly if they were captured and prisoners of war or if they were injured and in hospital somewhere. Uh, so he was very much a go-between and helping to uh, provide intelligence and information on loved ones. He also took it upon himself to organize uh, fundraisers for the war widows and orphans, not just of his rugby club members, but of the local community. And he did these through um, day-long sports festivals. So he's really kind of this early example of people-to-people um, -people cultural exchanges through sports diplomacy. Um, and he carried that theme through after the war, really building the rugby club, which is still there by the way, it's the professional club, uh, racing club Saint-Étienne. I think they were recently demoted to the second division, um, but they're still around. Um, and he, used, he built this club as a core foundation of the community post-war as a way to help heal and bring people together. When he was finally dispatched elsewhere in 1927, uh, there were rounds and rounds of fond farewell parties and um, commemorations uh, in his honor. Acknowledging not just his work in the community as the U.S. consular official, but how he had become such an ingrained part of them uh, through his wartime work. Um, I will stop there, and you can Terrific. certainly ask me questions to Terrific. bring out some of that material. <laughs> Thank you very much, Lindsay. We're next going to hear from Dr. Charles Hawley, uh, turning to another part of the uh, scene in World War I, who elaborated on the unprecedented efforts and difficulties, challenges, our colleagues face in representing the United States and the Russian Empire, including the challenge of looking after prisoners of war who were spread across the vast expanse of the Russian Empire. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Smith, and um, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to uh, say I, too, am honored, as Seth and uh, Lindsay are, to be here with you and appreciate the fact that you're giving up your 
lunchtime to, uh, to listen to what I think are fascinating histories. I'm almost tempted to cede my time so that I could hear more of, of their history, but that's almost. Because I think the, uh, the, what the US mission did in Imperial Russia is, is a history worth hearing too, and I'll only be able to give you a, a very brief account of it. At the outbreak of the war, the US mission in Imperial Russia had the same duties as those in Germany, Austria, Hungary, France, and the United Kingdom. Those were primarily assisting uh, American citizens with evacuation and, and other help. And the other was serving as protecting power, because the United States had agreed to sort of take over the responsibilities for both Germany and Austria-Hungary in Russia uh, at the uh, outbreak of the war, sort of take on, the, the, the United States was neutral, but they would look out for the interests of um, Germany and Austria-Hungary. And that included looking out for and ensuring the welfare and proper treatment of those countries' citizens in Russia, uh, which included prisoners of war. Um, the first duty, looking after American citizens, was relatively easy in Russia as opposed to some of the other countries. The, uh, there were few American citizens to begin with in Russia, relative, say, Berlin or London or Paris. Um, and most of them could actually get out if they wanted to pretty easily through Sweden. Um, there was an easy escape route that way. It was the second duty that became an almost overwhelming challenge. What made this challenge greater for the US mission in Russia than it was for the missions elsewhere was the enormity of that challenge. By 1917, the Russian Empire held, and these are military prisoners, about 160,000 German, but 2 million Austro-Hungarian prisoners of war. Uh, they also held civilians hostage or as prisoners. They refused to let them go back to their home countries, and they had about 200,000 German civilians and about 100,000 Austro-Hungarian civilians that they took from usually the borders and moved them off to Siberia. The, uh, what made the, the challenge even more difficult for the, uh, the mission was the scale of everything. You heard the, the size of the, uh, the prisoners of war uh, populations, but the mission itself was relatively understaffed. There were only seven, uh, there was the embassy in Petrograd and then seven consulates spread out throughout the, empire, the Russian Empire. And only 26 diplomatic and consular officers to cover all that territory. And it was spread out, and the empire was vast. It was about 8 million, 8.5 million square miles. And that included a lot of Siberia. And we only had one consulate in Siberia, and that was in Vladivostok, which was way at the other end of Siberia. Uh, in fact, the first, the first missions, relief missions, to look after these German and Austro-Hungarian prison wars actually came from the US mission in China which was relatively, relatively speaking close, closer to the, some of these camps in Siberia than Petrograd was. The other, uh, one of the other challenges too was the host country. Even though we were a neutral country and we're trying to work well with, uh, with Imperial Russia, Imperial Russia was essentially at this point poorly administered, failing as an empire, and completely unprepared for these huge numbers of POWs that were uh, flooding the country as uh, the Russian forces had successes in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Uh, finally, the mission itself uh, was sort of a problematic. Beyond its size, which was very small, we did not have the best A-team leadership there. In fact, when the war broke out, there was no ambassador. And then the ambassador that they did appoint initially uh, left after a year, and then they finally got a, uh, a second ambassador who was there till the, um, uh, the United States entered the war in 1917 in the Bolshevik Revolution. So the leadership was, was troubled. Uh, by the spring of 1916, although some progress had been made to bolster the mission's uh, POW relief and assistance efforts, oh, one thing I do want to add to, one of the other challenges too, besides the numbers of prisoners that they had to kind of look out for, was the relief money that was coming in. Millions and millions of dollars were coming in from Germany, Austria-Hungary, from uh, charity organizations, and from the family members of all these prisoners. 
And it was up to the United States to administer this money properly and keep track of it. So not only did they have to look out for the welfare of the, the actual prisoners, but they had all this money that they were kind of responsible for managing properly. By the spring of 1916, although some progress had been made to bolster the uh, mission's relief efforts, Washington wasn't satisfied. They ended up pulling, like I said, they pulled that first ambassador, George Marie, who went out in 1914, um, and they replaced him with David Francis, who would remain in the position till the Bolshevik Revolution and the end of US-Russia relations at the time. Uh, but at that time, though, fortunately, and this is where the story gets interesting, the heroes were not necessarily the top echelon. The diplomatic heroes were sort of the, the, from the rank and file of the diplomatic consular corps. And one person in particular that I want to highlight is Fred Deering. That guy up there. In the spring of 1916, he actually arrived at post a little before Francis did, the new ambassador. And he immediately noticed the need to reorganize. The mission was doing it all it could to sort of deal with this relief effort. But he noticed that it, and this is a quote from him, it should not be hid from the department that the work in caring for German and Hungarian prisoners uh, under the past embassy administration had come to a practical deadlock. I was compelled according, accordingly to begin with the bottom up. So essentially what he did was he established a whole different organization in addition to the embassy. He called it the second division. The, 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 the first division was the embassy proper, uh, and they did what normal embassies do. But he said, we need a, a, a complete organization dedicated to the relief work. So he managed against Washington that it was worth resourcing, and that's what they did. Unfortunately for Deering, uh, bad health compelled him to leave early, basically before his first year at, at post. But uh, then Washington sent, who I would sort of identify as yet another hero uh, of this particular mission, a guy named Basil Miles, who was an old Russia hand. He had served in 1905, 1906 in Russia. And he came out and kind of finished the job of standing up the second division. Um, and by the time 1917 rolled around, the second division itself had a staff of 35 in Petrograd alone, and 40 at the consulates and at sort of substations, because some of that staff were, uh, were actually officers who went out to inspect some of these prisoner war camps or try and meet with some of these prisoners, civilian prisoners out in um, Siberia. Uh, however, by the spring of 1917, just as the second division was finally taking shape, the US broke relations with Germany, uh, in February of 1917, and by April we had broken relations with Austro-Hungary, -Hung and we were going to war with them. Um, and so all this work to set up the second division kind of came to naught, and just as things were, you know, as, as, as is typical, just as things are finally starting to work, they had to take it all down. But, uh, but the, the sort of concluding thought for now, since I'm running out of time, is that if not for the efforts of these people who noticed the need for organization and new structures and a new way of doing things, uh, the suffering of the POWs, both civilian and military, would probably have been a, a lot worse. So they, you know, their efforts, though, was not complete. They did a very good job of trying to mitigate some of, uh, some of that suffering. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Charles. Last but not least, we have Dr. Thomas Faith, who will explain how the understaff U.S. mission embassy in London evolved into a central clearinghouse for all U.S. diplomatic activities in Europe. He'll also discuss how a lone consular official assigned to a post in southwestern Ireland dealt with the challenge surrounding the sinking of the Lusitania and other ships carrying American citizens. Thank you. Like my colleagues here, I'd also like to say thanks to the audience and, uh, and the appreciation of my, uh, uh, say how much I appreciate being here with my fellow panelists. Like my colleagues here have said of their posts in other countries, the US ambassador in London and his staff were similarly blindsided by the onset of war and the diplomatic challenges that resulted. First and foremost, among the challenges uh, that occurred at Embassy London was tending to the unprecedented humanitarian needs of over 100,000 US citizens located throughout the British Empire and throughout Europe. Now I say that the citizens in Europe uh, became charges of Embassy London because London and Great Britain and in, in general became way stations 
for American citizens who are trying to leave Europe at the time as they waited for transport uh, home. If you couldn't depart from France or, or Italy in general, you left on a passenger liner uh, leaving from Great Britain or Ireland. And while you waited on a, a, a berth uh, uh, to travel home, you were a charge of Embassy London if you needed uh, uh, food or money or clothing or a place to stay. Um, this created a, an atmosphere of perpetual crisis at an Embassy London that continued to occur in waves uh, throughout uh, the period from 1914 to 1917. The, the stress of this, uh, <laughs> these enormous responsibilities resulted in severe staffing challenges at US Embassy London, which means that there are a lot of diplomatic heroes at Embassy London, uh, way too many to cover uh, for today. I wanted to highlight um, Chandler Anderson, uh, who was a former counselor of the Department of State and happened to be living in London at the outbreak of war. He volunteered his services as the embassy's legal advisor, and he's one of the, uh, one of the most talented uh, international legal minds of, of the early 20th century, now working for Embassy London and, and writing papers uh, on every subject, subject imaginable for, for, for the embassy staff, papers on uh, US obligations uh, when it comes to international relief efforts, when it comes to supervising POWs, um, uh, when it comes to international shipping, and uh, uh, the U-boat war, uh, and so forth. And all of these legal opinions and, and all of this legal advice help guide Embassy London out of some very difficult situations and, and provide them with a, uh, uh, a guidebook uh, where, there, where none exists uh, for, for most of these issues. The, um, uh, so another Chandler, uh, Chandler Hale, uh, was a former assistant secretary of state who also happened to be living in London at the outbreak of war and volunteered his services. He took over Austrian interests uh, as when, uh, after, after the break in relations between Germany and Austria, Hungary and Great Britain, the US embassy just as in these other countries took over German and Austro-Hungarian interests within Great Britain and that meant supervising camps were, that held POWs from those countries and, and also citizens. Uh, in November 1914, there was a deadly riot at the Douglas Alien, Alien Camp uh, in Great Britain uh, that resulted in the deaths of several Germans and Austro-Hungarians and, and several uh, Britons. And no one trusted any other government to sort of get to the bottom of what happened uh, and, unless uh, Chandler Hale uh, from the United States was mentioned specifically as an impartial sort of third party observer and he was tasked with going to the camp and interviewing participants in the riot and witnesses and trying to determine exactly what happened. The, uh, I should mention very briefly here also the, uh, the work of volunteers, people who weren't directly affiliated with the department in one way or the other, like Herbert Hoover, um, who directed the uh, Belgian relief mission during, the, uh, during World War I, also operated out of, out of London in large part uh, with, with US Embassy London. The, German war against commercial shipping in the seas around Great Britain put Embassy London at the center of one of the most significant dilemmas the US government faced during the war. The, uh, when the department learned that over 128 US citizens uh, had been uh, killed in the sinking of the Lusitania, they depended on, uh, by and large, US Consul Wesley Frost who was the only US consul in Queenstown at the time. He had been, uh, this was only his second uh, overseas uh, uh, posting, and his, uh, he had only been there for a year, and he had to deal with one of the first mass casualty incidents uh, overseas uh, that the United States had ever faced. Um, and there's no, again, uh, guidebook uh, for how to deal with this. He had to, he had to manage it uh, more or less on his own, caring for the US survivors who had lost everything, including family members identifying uh, dead Americans so that he could alert their families back at home uh, uh, what, what had happened to them, and uh, keeping both the embassy uh, in London and the Department of State and the British government informed about everything that he learned uh, sort of along the way. Thank you. I'm, you know, I'm struck, uh, let me start off with just sort of an overarching question for all of our panelists. I'm struck though in, in listening to these presentations by uh, not only the enormity of the challenge that our colleagues faced uh, during the First World War in carrying out their responsibilities for assisting U.S. citizens and carrying out our obligations as a neutral power, but the fact that there was no blueprint for any of this. There really was no roadmap. There was no FAM that they could consult about how to, how to carry out an evacuation in these circumstances, and that they pioneered a lot of things that we think uh, are new from our perspective. And Lindsay mentioned the uh, sports diplomacy was only one, perhaps, in that regard. But uh, 
but I'm thinking more importantly of, of the public-private partnerships that really made possible um, the sort of work that they had to undertake in that regard. It really is remarkable when you think about this. They did it, by the way, without any L vetting process or anything else that, <laughs> that we have to deal with today. Um, not to uh, disparage any of our L colleagues, but, but they had to do this on the fly uh, and do what they thought was best under the circumstances. And I think it's remarkable. I just wonder if any of our panelists would like to comment more on that public-private element of all of this. Yeah. Well, certainly that's what that's what helped to make everything possible within the France context the you know given the fact that you had maybe a half dozen official embassy employees you know th they had to rely on um, the the volunteerism and the spirit of service uh, from the American not only citizens in France, whether they were resident there or stranded there, but also in the American business community. Um, and they happen to be perhaps somewhat lucky, depending on how you look at it, that one of the leaders of the American business community in Paris was Herman Harges, who operated the Paris division of J.P. Morgan. Um, and so through that and the connections with um, the Morgan Bank in New York, they were able to quickly um, rectify some of the fiscal issues. But that is just one example of the many of the public-private partnerships uh, that got underway, and particularly a lot when you talk about the hospital services and um, medical, uh, tons and tons of uh, medical volunteers, doctors and nurses uh, from the United States arriving, trying to do anything they could for any of the war wounded, not just the French, not just you know any one side. And I think that helped to really uh, spark a lot of goodwill. Um, and reading the accounts, that's what you find, or at least in the first part of the war that um, this was focused on, just goodwill to try to create solutions, no matter how outside the box or how abnormal they were, um, in recognition that something had to be done, and quickly. Um, <clears throat> if I could speak to that just very quickly. Probably almost out of time. Uh, it was the same situation in Germany, at least in the beginning, when there was some goodwill. Um, uh, Ambassador uh, Sir Gerard, he was able to um, negotiate an agreement with uh, the Dresdner Bank so that they would actually cash checks from Americans. So it actually turned, uh, turned the embassy into a, um, a travel agency uh, with uh, some of the Germ uh, big um, so German shipping lines. Um, the third secretary uh, offered up um, a, a large amount of money, 10,000 marks, uh, uh, the equivalent of maybe about, uh, about $60,000 in cash uh, right away, and with a promise from his grandfather for another 2.4 million, so some like 20 million. So that was very helpful. <clears throat> um, as the war grew, on, uh, grew old, um, James Yard was in a very difficult uh, position uh, in Washington and also among his colleagues back home, Democratic um, political friends. They saw him as uh, more and more pro-German uh, and anti-British, while the German government and German industry, these, uh, well, these German banks, saw him um, uh, particularly as anti-German and pro-British, and this is one of the things that um, <clears throat> stopped some of those uh, public-private um, so partnerships and also ruined his political uh, so career when he came home. No one really liked him that much for a while. <laughs> He's also a classic cla uh, Hatch Act violation in <laughs> running for office. <laughs> should be used in our, our ethics a, uh, course yes, yes. online, I think. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. I don't know how much uh, we've got, frankly, and I, I know all of you are giving up your lunch hour for this. I did want to ask a few more questions, but, but I also wanted to underscore that after today's event, uh, our panelists will be in the lobby outside. We've got a display, courtesy, I think, a lot of Bureau of Consular Affairs, thank you for, to them, uh, of, of passports and other documents from the time that I think are, are just wonderful to look at, and, and uh, hopefully all of you will be able to spend some time. I did want to underscore, though, uh, the importance not just of, uh, of these heroes and the work that they did, but also the impact this had on the Department of State. Um, Ambassador Rieker talked about this at the beginning of our presentation today, but in many ways this leads to the modern form of the Department of State. A lot of the lessons learned that are drawn during this period are applied in the post-war period. Uh, efforts made to, to modernize and to professionalize the Foreign Service, notwithstanding the fact that it was great to have people with deep pockets and a lot of private sector experience, uh, 
at our missions during the war, but there was a recognition that there needed to be a more professionalized service, um, uh, one with uh, dedicated civil and, and foreign service officers running it. Uh, that had a profound impact. In January 1919, longtime department advocate, Congressman John Jacob Rogers, introduces the first of many bills that are proposed over the subsequent five years to improve the status and professional capacities of the nation's diplomats. The final version of what came to be known as the Rogers Act, of course, was signed into law in May of 1924. I think it's safe to say the heroic work of American men and women responding to the challenges of the First World War is important, not only for the way in which it inspires us today, but also how it shaped, as I say, the structure of the Department of State today. I'm delighted that we've had this opportunity to share some of the experiences and sacrifices of these unsung heroes and their contributions to our national security. I want to commend uh, our panelists today for their contributions. Uh, I also want to refer all of you to the, uh, uh, if you're interested, particularly in nominating somebody for the Heroes Among Us, to our Heroes of Diplomacy at state.gov for more details. You can also visit state.gov Heroes of Diplomacy to learn more about this initiative. Uh, I hope all of you can join us outside in the lobby afterwards for uh, an opportunity to, to uh, get in more detail with some of the, our colleagues here uh, and to see these, uh, this wonderful exhibit. So thank you all very much for coming.